teaching, teaches primarily in the area of systematic theology. His research interest focuses on the role of the spirit in the life of the church and exploring how the interaction between science and theology raises fundamental questions about reality and the nature of time. But before taking up his current role, um, Greg's journey has included PhDs in both systematic theology and quantum physics. Being, and he's also been the senior pastor of a local Auckland suburban Baptist church. Um, and so, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Please welcome um, Greg back. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's it's lovely to be here. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, I realise that um, most of you don't know me. I'll just explain just a little bit more about me. The, the first thing I need to say. Uh, I'm Australian, I'm so sorry. Um, there's, there's literally nothing that I could do about it, but I was, as soon as I was old enough, I came over to New Zealand. It has to count for something, right? Doesn't it? Surely. And, you know, now I direct for the black caps and all that kind of stuff. But I do live in Auckland, which I guess is a point against me, really, too, isn't it? So, um, the, the second thing about me is while I was growing up, um, you know, I wanted to be just like Jeff. I wanted to be a physicist. I, I, I probably, in, in, in most audiences, uh, that's a problem, but in this audience, probably you, you, you think you understand where I'm coming from when I, when I say that, right? So uh, I, I always wanted to be like that. So I, I grew up, I, uh, I did my undergraduate degree in Queensland, and then uh, came across and did a PhD with a fellow called uh, Professor Dan Walls, who some of you might have heard of, um, in uh, the Auckland University. And it was actually, it was actually while I was um, uh, just near the end of my PhD, I was um, in, in a room in my um, and in my house, sort of praying one night, and I felt God speak really clearly to me, and he said, oh, I, I, don't, I don't want you to be a physicist. And again, nothing wrong with being a physicist, a really cool thing to be, but um, I don't want you to be a physicist, I want you to be a pastor. And um, that was kind of uh, unexpected, and let's be honest, it was kind of unwelcome uh, as well, um, because I was, uh, you know that kind of uh, cliche of a physicist who's kind of, you know, not overly socially confident, and that kind of stuff? <laughs> That was definitely me, probably is still me a little bit. And so, you know, being a pastor was quite um, a bit of a challenge. And uh, so I, uh, I, um, I actually got a job as a management consultant, you know, one of these big American consulting companies where they say, you know, be in Chicago on Thursday. And, uh, and so I uh, did that for a few years to sort of get some real, exp real life experience. And after that, um, uh, followed back to um, two years in New Zealand, two years back in Australia. While, when I was in Australia, I, I met and married this uh, wonderful human being, Diane. Suddenly, being in Chicago on Thursday wasn't nearly as exciting as it had been before. And so I um, started looking around for various colleges to go to and ended up going to Kiri Baptist College. I was a senior pastor at Hillsborough Baptist for a while. Um, tried to do a PhD simultaneously. This is where what Gray's done is really quite extraordinary. I tried to do a similar PhD in theology simultaneously with working and failed dismally at that. Um, and so ended up having to decide one way or the other and ended up deciding to, to do a PhD. So I did a PhD on the role of the spirit in the life of the church. And then um, I sort of did some half-time pastoring and lecturing. And about five or six years ago, they asked me to come on staff there. So that's my story. So sort of physics and science and theology sort of, they, they go together a little bit for me. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about, about, about time. So I think it was, was, I can't remember what the, but yeah, I asked this question about time. Well, I, I kind of feel like I, this, is, this is where we're going in this talk, is to talk about time. It's often, isn't it true that the simplest questions are the hardest ones? For example, I remember, I remember sitting back in a physics class when I was in year 11 in Australia, so that's the second last year of high school. My physics teacher asked me, asked the class the question, well, what, 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 is, what is time? And um, you, you think about it, you think, well, it seems like such an obvious question. Uh, time, is, time is just what happens as you go from moment to moment. Time is, uh, time is what happens when nothing else is happening. And it didn't take us very long to realise that it wasn't an obvious question. It's a really hard question. Um, if we had to admit, actually, we didn't have a really good answer to this question. That was okay, because it turns out that not many people do have a good answer to this question. Um, for example, someone apparently um, asked Albert Einstein 
uh, this question. You, you think he'd know, right? Albert Einstein, uh, one of the smartest people ever, came up with special and general relativity, two theories that kind of revolutionized our understanding of time. So you think Einstein would have a good answer to this question. But when someone asked Einstein what time is, his response was, time is what the clock says. <laughs> Which is, you know, perhaps we could recast that and say time is what is measured on a clock. And physicists have thought a lot about time over the last century or so. They experimentally demonstrated that time stretches and bends. So if you go really fast, then time goes slower for you than it does for someone else who's standing still as measured by them, which is really quite an extraordinary fact to be able to measure. But what is even more extraordinary is the fact that some of this physicist thinking is starting to intersect and impact the study of theology. And that's mostly what I wanted to talk to you about today. Now I'm aware that I've, I've been talking, you've had two wonderful scientists speaking to you and now you've got a theologian, so it's sure to get complex at this particular point. So um, what I wanted to do, if it's okay with you, is every so often I'm just going to check that you're still with me. And if you're still with me, can you sort of boldly and loudly say, yes, well, I'm with you, or yes, and that, that will be great and that will make me feel really good. And if you're not with me, perhaps you could just say yes anyway, because it'll make me feel good to feel like you're, you're with me even if you're not. Is that okay? So are you with me? Yeah. 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 That's fantastic. Okay. Because <laughs> theologians have thought a lot about time as well. Actually, they, they've thought quite a lot about time. For example, classical theology, this is almost exactly what you said, uh, was, uh, has always maintained that God is outside of time. God is outside of time because he's outside the universe, theologians say. God essentially created time when he created the universe. So Augustine, for example, 5th century early church father, wrote that there can be no time without creation. He wrote, you, O Lord, made that very time, and no time could pass by before you made those times. But if there was no time before heaven and earth, why do they ask what you did then? There was no then when there was no time. So, the word theologians use to describe this aspect of God being outside of time is to say that God is eternal. I think that's one thing that physicists and theologians have in common. They come up with very simple words to describe very complex things, right? So, God is eternal, theologians say. While humans are temporal, kind of stuck in time, God is eternal. He's not bound by time. So, being eternal, theologians say, that's part of God's divine nature. Now, it was Karl Barth. Um, in his mammoth church dogmatics. I'm not sure if you're familiar with church dogmatics. Two million words, it takes about that much space on my shelf. Um, one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century had one, what, what many people consider one of the greatest theological insights of the 20th century, where he said that, he said that, that this, when the Son of God became human, he didn't just unite humanity and divinity together, he also united eternity and time together. It is worthwhile thinking through what he means when he says that. Like, what happens when Jesus becomes incarnate? Well, what happens is that two things that we always thought were completely distinct from each other, God and humanity, are brought together in one person. Jesus, as we teach in every Christology class, is 100% divine, 100% human, and he's both of those things while still being one person. Two natures, one person. It doesn't matter if we don't understand that, it happened. It's a fact, and it's our job to make the best sense of it that we can. Indeed, theologians spent the first 400 years after Jesus' death trying to make sense of that union, all the way up to the Chalcedonian definition in 452. Well, says Karl Barth, in almost exactly the same way, when Jesus became incarnate, not only was humanity and divinity united together in him, time and eternity are united together in him. So Jesus Christ is 100% eternal and 100% temporal, says Barth. And he's both of those things while still just being one person. Again, it doesn't matter if we don't understand that. It happened. It's a fact. And it's our job to make the best sense of it that we can. And I don't know that theologians before the advent of modern physics ever made much sense of that idea. But modern physics, with its recognition that time is not quite as absolute as we had thought that it was, but has this ability to, to bend and stretch, has started us to, to give us an inkling of how we can make sense of the fact that time and eternity somehow fit together. So Karl Barth, who by his own admission didn't really understand much of modern physics, he went some way towards exploring this idea that time and eternity are united together in Christ. But some of the theologians that followed him went even further than that. And particularly important here is the work of a Scottish theologian by the name of T.F. Torrance. Um, Torrance is often known as the scientific theologian because he, he tried to bring the insights of theology and science together. And one area where he particularly tried to do this, and where I think he made some really good progress, was in this understanding of time. 
And so Torrance says that we should see that in the person of Christ, there's essentially been a union between eternity and time. Well, that means that there, there, are, there are three times that need to be considered here. And Torrance can think in this kind of way because of modern physics. It means that time is not quite as absolute as we thought it was. And so there's not just one time, but many, which gives him this opportunity of, of considering Jesus as operating in a, in a different kind of time to the time we're operating. So for Torrance, first, there's, there's fallen time, which is the time that we currently in, in, exist in and experience. So we'll draw a line to, to represent that. And second, there's eternity, which is God's time. And that's the, the, the I don't know, the plane or the sheet of, of the screen up there. And then finally, says Torrance, and this is the interesting bit, he says there is new time or redeemed time. A time that in the person of Christ is a union of fallen time and eternity together. Now, it's kind of difficult to know how to draw that, but we'll represent it as a, another line parallel to the first, and we'll call that line redeemed time. But Torrance goes much further than just using an incarnational analogy to explore the way that time and eternity go together. He says, we have to go a step beyond the incarnation and carry the hypostatic union in our thought through the cross to its perfection in the resurrection. So we must think of fallen time, he says, as having perfected itself through the cross and the resurrection into the abiding triumph of the perfection in God, which both consummates the original purpose of creation and crowns it in glory. So for Torrance, there are, there are kind of two dimensions to be considered here in terms of time. Torrance actually talks about this as two different tensions, but that word seems to confuse people, so we use slightly different terminology. So Torrance says essentially there are, there are like two different dimensions in time. One is a dimension or a tension between old time and new time, between redeemed time and, and old fallen time. And Torrance calls that the eschatological dimension. And we can see a picture here as vertically in this diagram. And the other dimension is between time and eternity. And uh, Torrance calls this the teleological dimension, telos, you know, purpose, goal, that kind of thing, which is difficult to draw, and again, but we'll, we'll picture it horizontally. And Torrance says that an appropriate understanding of the relationship between time and eternity will have a balance between this eschatological and teleological dimension. So it won't excessively focus on the eschatological and ignore the teleological, and it won't excessively focus on the teleological and ignore the eschatological. And helpfully, I think, Torrance uh, describes the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist as corresponding to these two dimensions. So baptism is a, is a vertical thing, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a once-off. It's all about humans being incorporated into Christ and new creation and the, this, this link between redeemed time and new time. So you can think of it uh, vertically in this eschatological dimension. And the Lord's Supper, or, or the Eucharist, he says, in contrast, is repeated and repeatable, grounded in the flow of time. And as Torrance says, that it corresponds to the ongoing and developing interaction that exists between time and eternity, that he calls the teleological dimension, or you can see it here horizontally. Now, I should say here, and um, I realise diagrams aren't perfect, okay. Um, I, I, um, physicists love diagrams, uh, and I think they generally use them really, really well. Theologians hate diagrams, literally. And uh, you put a diagram up in a theological conference and you're asking for trouble, basically. <laughs> um, I think that's kind of sad, because I think diagrams help an awful lot. But only if you look at what they're trying to say, and not look for all of their inadequacies. So hopefully, you're not going to push me over the edge here, and you look at what this diagram is trying to say, and not look for all the inadequacies where it doesn't exactly match reality. So, let me just check. Are you still with me? Yes. 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 Fantastic. Thank you. So the question that naturally follows from this diagram and this understanding is, how does Christ's experience of redeemed time, where time and eternity are united together, how does that impact our present experience of living in fallen time? How does Christ's time impact our time? That's a question I've been spending a lot of my time thinking about the last few years. I've been trying to follow the theological trajectory of Barr and Torrance and see if we can push even a little bit further than they have. And the more you reflect on it, the more I think it becomes obvious that the only satisfactory conclusion you can come to here is that through the Spirit, all of Christ's experience in new time impacts the present moment that we are at, at in old time. All of Christ's past, present, and future, the entirety of his heavenly session, to use the theological language if you want to put it that way, impacts us at the present moment that we are in old time. 
So Christ's past in new time impacts us by bringing forward the revelation of Christ's past work. It's essentially Christ's prophetic role for us, where we are now. Christ proclaims to us the truth of who he is and what he's done through his presence by the Spirit. Through bringing Christ's past into our present, the Spirit reveals to us the truth of our salvation in him. You could say that by bringing Christ's past into our present, it changes what we know. Bar explores this idea in quite some depth. We'll talk about that. And not just Christ's past, but Christ's presence in new time impacts us as well. It impacts us through our participation in Christ's ongoing vicarious humanity, vicarious on our behalf. This is essentially Christ's priestly role for us where we are now. So through bringing Christ's ongoing present into our present, the Spirit enables Christ to stand in the gap for us. And that fundamentally changes everything about us. The fact that we live in Christ and He lives in us, it changes our status and reality. You could say that by bringing Christ's present into our present, it has an ontological effect on us. It changes who we are at the very fundamental level of our being. And T.F. Torrance is one who talks a lot about that. And of course, there's more that you can say here, though. Because in addition, to this bringing, in, in addition to the Spirit bringing Christ present, past forward to us, in addition to the Spirit bringing Christ present to us where we are, we also have to say that Christ's future in redeemed time impacts us by bringing back to us Christ's coming kingdom. There's essentially Christ's kingly role for us where we are now. Through bringing Christ's future into our present, the Spirit transforms us, taking us on a journey to become more and more fit to belong in that coming kingdom. You could say that by bringing Christ's future into our present, it has this transformation, this gradual transformation of us. This is the area that I've been trying to explore a little bit by building on the work of Barr and Torrance. Now, for those of you who have um, done some theological study in the past, you'll recognize here the three roles of Christ are represented, right? Christ is often talked about as prophet, priest, and king. That's an idea that can be traced all the way back to Justin Martyr in the second century, but it's most commonly associated with John Calvin and the Geneva Catechism. In fact, theologians have a fancy term for those three roles. They call them the munus triplex, um, which is just Latin for three roles. So it doesn't really mean that much. <laughs> but what's important to recognize here is that even though we're talking about the prophet, priest, and king, this, this, this old style munus triplex that Calvin talks about, for him, Christ offices as prophet, priest, and king are all time here. So when, when Calvin talks about the monastery triplets, he always moves from then to now. So as prophet, Christ revealed God to humanity during his incarnation. And the truth is brought forward to us by the word and the spirit. And as priest, Christ offers himself as a sacrifice during his earthly session. He dies for us. And then the benefits of joint access to God are brought forward to us by the spirit. And then finally, as king, Christ established his kingdom during his earthly session, and we enjoy the benefits of living under the jurisdiction of this new, come, continuing kingdom. So the logic of Calvin is always from then to now, from the earthly session to the benefits that it brings to us. But here, we're saying something completely different. Through looking at time in this, this new way, in the light of modern physics, what we have here is an eschatological Monos triplex. That's nice and complex for you, isn't it? Yeah, an eschatological monos triplex. One that's complementary to Calvin's old time-bound monos triplex, but goes well beyond it. So with the eschatological monos triplex, we aren't talking about how what Christ did back then impacts us now. Our logic just isn't time-bound. We're talking about how Christ right now, in redeemed time, in the redeemed time he is currently experiencing, continues to be prophet, priest, and king for us. And so... In the minutes that I've got left, what I want to do is just explain, expand on this, to explain how Christ's experience of redeemed time impacts our experience in, in fallen time, and particularly how it impacts our transformation, which I think is key. <coughs> so I start off on the left here um, uh, by talking about how Christ's past in redeemed time affects our present, or Christ's eschatological prophetic office, to use the technical terms. And as I mentioned earlier, this is something that Karl Barth deals with really, really well, particularly in the um, fourth volume of Church Dogmatics. So again, this massive two million words of Church Dogmatics broken up into four volumes. The fourth volume has three different parts to it. It's kind of very complex, isn't it? And then in, the, in each of the parts of them, he deals with prophet, priest, and king. Well, actually, he deals with priest, king, and prophet. That's a really, really important point. So in the first part of volume four, Bart talks about the priestly office, so Christ's humiliation and its implications. So the words he uses, the Lord is servant. 
The second part of volume four, he talks about the kingly office. That's Christ's exaltation and its implications. And he says, the servant as Lord. Now, both of those volumes, they're stunning pieces of work, but they are both intrinsically time-bound. They work from then to now, from Christ's earthly session to the present situation. But when Bart turns to the final part volume, focusing on Christ's prophetic office as the true witness, he goes beyond that. For Bart, Christ's prophetic role is not merely that he revealed the truth of God to us during the earthly session, and now we know about that truth. It's not just then to now logic. Notice, for example, how Bart switched the order of the, the normal monostriplex. It wasn't, wasn't prophet, priest, king. He did priest, king, prophet. So that Christ's prophetic office is seen as the fulfillment of his role, building cumulatively on the others. For Bart, it's precisely because of the humiliation of Christ's priestly office, and precisely because of his exaltation in his kingly office, that Christ is now the prophet in his heavenly session, the prophet who reveals to us the truth about the state of the new reconciled God of humanity. That's why Paul Bart, and those of you who've read any Bart will know this phrase, reconciliation is revelation. Reconciliation is revelation. So reconciliation with Bart is fundamentally about knowledge. It's about knowing the truth. Christ has done this, and now that knowledge gets conveyed to us. Christ is the truth who we engage. See, the thing for Bart is that it's not just that he takes the truth and brings that truth to our knowledge. Christ is the truth that he brings to us. See, Christ is with us, and we engage in this Christ eschatologically through his prophetic office. So that point is, is preeminent, it's pivotal, it's central for Bart. He rejects all forms of sacramental mediation because Christ is not absent. The prophetic revelation of Christ is the eschatological reality of Christ himself. And then, even more than that, he goes on and says, Ah, the church's role reflects Christ's role. So, if the Christ is primarily about being a prophet, so just as Christ's primary role is prophetic, the church's role is witness. So, Christ's primary role is to reveal the truth. What is our primary role as the church? We point to the truth. And that is all we do. And if we do any more than that, says Bart, we're going beyond what the church should do. We become not more, but less. So, in this diagram, the connection between you and old time is eliminated through Bart's analysis has three key features. First, it's prophetic. So, Christ doesn't just convey the truth about God. He himself is the truth that we encounter. Second, it affects our knowledge. It's about what we know. And what we know, says Bart, is Christ. We know Christ himself. Christ brings the revolution, revelation of reconciliation. And third, it connects the beginning of new time with our present moment of existence in fallen time. So Bart is more focused on the objective reality of what Christ has done for us rather than the transformational effect that it will have on us through time. So using Bart as a guide, we've explored this, this first aspect of the connection between Christ's redeemed time and our fallen time. This arrow starting from the beginning of new time and coming down to our present moment. That's a start, but we can say more, right? What then of Christ's present in redeemed time? How does that impact our present moment in fallen time? And so to help with this, we turn to the work of T.F. Torrance, and who makes a creative attempt to go beyond Bart in understanding this by focusing primarily on Christ's ongoing priestly office. So actually, apparently, Torrance and Bart, they're really, really famous theologians. Apparently, Torrance went to Bart one day and suggested that he hadn't done a great job of dealing with the uh, priestly office in church dogmatics. You realise that? That is just sacrilege to say something like that. Apparently, Bart responded by suggesting that Torrance should rewrite church dogmatics for him, um, <laughs> which Torrance obviously didn't take up that particular offer. But he, he, Torrance writes a huge amount about this, uh, this theme of the priestly role. And for Torrance, he makes sense of the Christ priestly role by exploring the ascension. And while in the Incarnation, God existed in humanity's space, Torrance says, but now in the Ascension, humanity in Christ exists in God's space. That, that itself is a sentence that could be expanded hugely. So to categorise Christ's continuing activity in the Ascension, Torrance obviously turns to the monastery place. So Christ continues to be king, prophet, and priest in his heavenly session. Here the order, king, prophet, priest. So, Torrance's explanation of Christ's kingly office is, is brief and traditional. It takes less than a page. Torrance essentially says exactly the same thing that Calvin said, that Christ is installed in king, as king in his ascension, and now we live in the light of that. That's the classic then-to-now logic that Calvin had always done. Torrance's explanation of Christ's prophetic office matches exactly with Bart's understanding. Through the Spirit, Christ himself is present, delivering a prophetic word of reconciliation. But then... 
when it comes to the priestly office. Torrance doesn't just say that Christ offered up an acceptable sacrifice to us like Calvin or Bach did. Christ's priesthood is not something that he has done, it's something that he is doing. Christ, period, Christ stands in the gap for us. Christ is, and this is Torrance's words, the ongoing exclusive language, not only for God to speak to us, but for us to speak to God. And the result of that ongoing priestly mediation, he says, is ontological transformation. We're changing the fundamental level of our being. The fact that Christ right now is our high priest, that in redeemed time he stands in the gap between God and us, that changes everything, says Torrance. Changes everything about who we are and what we do. This is Torrance. He says, this applies to the whole of my life in Christ and to all of my human responses to God. For in Jesus Christ, they are all laid hold of and sanctified and informed by his vicarious, vicarious life on of obedience and response to the Father. This, this again, is just such a huge, important point. It deserves way more time than I can give it here. In fact, I have colleagues, um, no, no exception, no, no, no exaggeration. They, they do nothing with their academic lives except trying to explain that point of Torrance. Because what Torrance is, is, is saying here is that Christ didn't just die for us, but that he lives for us. He, he is living for us right now in redeemed time. You think of that famous verse in Galatians. Was it Galatians 2.20? Um, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Christ is living his redeemed life in redeemed time in and through us so that everything we do, everything we are, is in him and through him. Now, again, if you get that, that changes the way that you live. Like the pressure is off and life here on earth becomes not something to endure or something that you have to strive for, but something that you get to enjoy. It's not about doing stuff for Christ, it's about participating in Christ's life. When I realised that truth, it changed the way I went about being a pastor. And the implication for the church here is very significant. Remember how Bart, when he talked about Bart's prophetic emphasis that led him to an ecclesiology of understanding of the church as a witnessing body? Well, Torrance's priestly emphasis leads him to an understanding of the church as a body in communion, right? Torrance spends a lot of time explaining the church's royal priesthood. This is Torrance again. The New Testament applies priestly language to the church, showing that the church is given to participate in Christ's ministry in word, deed, and life. We live our lives in Him. We participate in His life in redeemed time right now. So, for Bart, the Spirit takes Christ past in redeemed time and brings it personally to bear on the church's present reality. Torrance, without losing Bart's prophetic emphasis, he then takes Christ's priestly role and explains how we participate in his ongoing life and how he participates in ours. Now let me just check with you because there's a lot of words there. You still with me? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, it was slightly less effusive than previously, but sure, we'll just take it and we'll move on. If you think that was astounding, and it is, there's more. It gets better. So how does Christ's future in redeemed time impact our present? How is Christ's coming kingdom present in the church? And how does that coming kingdom impact our current existence in fallen time? And that's something that neither Bart nor Torrance have explored in detail. And to be honest, most other theologians that try and do it still do it in a very time-bound way where they, they collapse new time onto old time and they put them together. So the way, obviously, to be able to do this, like all good systematic theology, is to lean really heavily on the biblical material, the revelation, the revelation of mystery, to use phrase two. There you go. So, um, so first what we have to do is recognise, well, what are the characteristics of the coming kingdom? So the kingdom is a place of, of truth, no lies or deception. It's a place of justice. Wrongs are right and evil is judged. It's a place of life where there's healing and fullness. It's a place of love where enmity and hatred are no more. And these are just some features of, of the coming kingdom. And what we can explore is how through the Spirit these qualities get brought back, how the Spirit brings back truth, justice, life and love and increasingly makes them characteristics of our present experience here in fallen time. So what I'm going to do here, just to make this more manageable, is just to skip all of the detailed biblical analysis and just explain the general principles that emerge when you do this kind of stuff. Because what you do, when, what you get when you do this biblical analysis is four key points. So first, the qualities of truth, life, justice, and love that exist in the kingdom, they do be, they, they exist there because Christ is king. Right? It's only because Christ is truly king in his kingdom that his character is reflected so perfectly in the coming kingdom. Second, through the Spirit, these characteristics get brought back to be part of our ecclesial existence now. It is because Christ dwells among us as King by His Spirit that our communities are places, or can be even partly places, of truth, life, justice, and love. 
Of course, not fully, though, because the fourth kingdom is not fully here. It hasn't yet arrived yet. The third point explores the implications that this has for the church. In bringing back the presence of Christ the King to us, the Spirit doesn't just make it possible for those things to exist within us, but He leads us and drives us on towards the coming kingdom so that the presence of those king coming kingdom qualities become increasingly apparent among us. And fourth and finally, and quite wonderfully, the Spirit's work goes beyond just the communities that we're part of to be the purveyor of these qualities in part to the world. This is our kingly role. We're not through force or intrinsic authority, but through persuasion as kingly representatives living in a foreign land. We can sometimes act as purveyors of truth, life, justice, and love to the world around us. Now, obviously, that is only the briefest beginning. And there are many further questions you could explore here, like how do we go about partnering with the Spirit in the transformation that He takes us through? And that's something that we can explore later if you want to. But as the last major section, the last major thing I want to talk about, what I want to do is step back and see if I can give you, um, step back from all the details, see if I can give you the big, a, a glimpse of the big picture. So what I've been saying here is that the entirety of Christ's redeemed life, all of his life and redeemed time, his birth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his communion with the Father, his coming kingdom through the Spirit, all of it impacts the present moment that we are living in now. And what that means is that through the Spirit, the church is in Christ and participating in His life. And so we have a fundamentally new way of being where the old rules of before and after do not simplistically apply anymore. Rather, our new existence is an intrinsically cruciform existence where in Christ and through His Spirit, we're constantly and simultaneously experiencing the reality of birth, death, resurrection, ascension, kingdom in our day-to-day -day lives. This reality is available because Christ lives His new redeemed time through us. That's that vertical dimension. But what happens is that vertical dimension where Christ lives His life through us, it feeds our confirmation process in the teleological dimension, the horizontal direction. So the Spirit takes Christ past the prophetic proclamation of our salvation. Christ's present, a priestly enabling of a communal relationship. And Christ's future, a kingly manifestation of our future glory. And he brings all three of them to bear on our present reality as we move through time. What that means is that we are living moment by moment, day by day, a communal and yet intensely personal experience of life and death, of joy and suffering, of self-giving love. But as we live in this reality through the Spirit, we are being conformed more and more to the image of the Christ through this new um, self-giving way of being. It is simply the way He was and is. We're learning to be what He always was. We're learning it through the same process that He learned it, by giving up our rights to self-determination and allowing the Spirit to guide us. And in this way, we're, we're practicing and preparing and hoping and being transformed for our time where, where our ongoing many deaths and resurrections will lead to an actual physical death and an actual physical resurrection. So the small stories and experiences that we have over and over again in our life contribute to the, the communal and time-stretching story that we're a part of. What I'm saying here, and this is my last point, is that the shape of time has an essentially fractal-like character. So fractals... Um, sure, I don't need to explain this to people here, but uh, this, this, they're, they're mathematical curves or geometrical shapes where if you focus in more and more on one part, it exhibits the same kind of pattern as you see in the broader scale. So there's a video there of a fractal image that's, 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 a fractal image that's increasingly being focused on. And sometimes fractals uh, are used by uh, scientists to understand snowflakes, or I used fractals back in um, when I was doing uh, research in physics to understand um, uh, uh, chaos in the quantum realm. So the point I'm trying to make through introducing this image is that if we look at the broad expanse of time, or if we look at the individual bits, you see the same shapes reoccurring. That broad, overarching master story of birth, death, resurrection, ascension, kingdom, it's not just one big story that we fit into, but it, it gets lived again and again on smaller scales. You see it in Christ, you see it in the universal church community of time, you see it in the lives of individual church communities. You see it in the full length of our individual lives from beginning to end. You see it in the episodic lives of our families. You see it in our individual experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. These smaller fractal images that define our existence. But it, 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 the Spirit works through each of them to conform us into Christ's image. So that each of the small images echo and illustrate the larger picture. 
Through each of these practical sub-images, we, we learn what it means to live an ongoing, cruciform existence. And as we do that, that cruciform, self-giving picture of overall reality becomes our defining reality. If, if you get this, and uh, this is my tip to bring it home, it, it makes a difference to how you live. Right? I have a lovely um, a daughter, she's 21. Um, uh, a few years ago, she was a teenager, kind of obviously. And, um, and she, uh, she went through a really, really, really tough time. I read recently, was it that uh, was it one in three teenage girls in New Zealand suffer from depression? I, I don't know if you'd say that was what Emily went through, but um, whatever the correct uh, technical term for it, it was horrible. It was just horrible. It was horrible to watch. It was horrible to be in. And I remember, right when she was in the middle of the depths of despair and these struggles, the pastor at our church was preaching this series about uh, you know, you should open yourself up to the people in church because the church is there for you and cares for you and will support you. And I remember Emily, after listening to this, suggesting quite forcefully, and she, um, she can be quite forceful when she wants to be, um, uh, that the church actually wasn't like that. And it wasn't even close. It wasn't even a bit like that. And I remember trying to tell her at the time, well, you know, we're on a journey and we're not everything that we're supposed to be yet. But I, I don't know that she was convinced, and I'm not sure whether or not that was the best answer I could have given. But having gone through this process of thinking about the relationship between Christ and redeemed time, and our space in fallen time, and what that means for us, it strikes me that the right answer to her question, perhaps not, not, not one that she could necessarily hear at that time, but certainly the right answer, is that the church is changing, and the church will change, and the church is being conformed to the image of Christ. And that's happening precisely because of what Emily went through. Precisely because through the Spirit, Christ in His redeemed time is right with her in the midst of her challenges and difficulties. And as she suffered and yet through the, the quiet, empowering and guiding of the Spirit, she still chose to remain obedient, still chose to remain in community, still chose to remain a part of the church and play her part in it as she lived her own crucible moment her own death and resurrection. And she did that even though she couldn't see the use of it or the end of it or the place of God in it. It was at that very experience that the whole church was changed and Emily and her church family was changed too. It was through this that we developed and grew together, becoming a little bit more a place of life, of truth, of justice, of love. It was through this that we're prepared to be a little bit more ready for this coming kingdom was through this that we become a little bit more like the self-giving God that we claim to worship. It reminds me a little bit of what <coughs> C.S. Lewis had screw tape say when he identified once and for all that moment when transformation truly happens, those cruciform moments of which even devils are <coughs> truly afraid, and where the redeemed time of Jesus, um, the redeemed time that Jesus experiences and the fallen time that we experience come closest together. He said this, Don't be deceived, wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished, asks why he has been forsaken, and yet still obeys. That's it. There you go.